Wait, 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 wait. Before you click off, I am not saying that this is an appalling film. In fact, I will admit and agree that this is a truly amazing film. And a lot of modern day cinema is thanks to this film. It reinvigorated the whole sci-fi genre. Now, as many people in my series know, I love Star Trek. But I'm also well aware that Star Trek as we know it today would not be around if it wasn't for Star Wars. Hell, even the Alien franchise would not be around if it wasn't for Star Wars. But that being said, it's not a perfect film and there are things wrong with this film. Want to know what I mean? Well, join me. I'm Berryman and this is 10 Things Wrong With. Star Wars, retroactively titled Star Wars Episode 4 A New Hope, is a 1977 American epic space opera film written and directed by George Lucas. It tells the story of a young farmer boy by the name of Luke Skywalker who gets caught in an amazing adventure between the Imperial Empire and the Rebel Alliance. And along the way he meets many new friends and starts his journey on towards becoming a Jedi Knight. When the film was released in 1977, it quickly became a blockbuster hit. And everything about this film was praised. In fact, there was no negative reviews about it. But what have I found wrong with this film? Well, let's talk about 10 things wrong with Star Wars. Number 10, name. So we're gonna start off with this list with something that's not actually to do with the film, but it is about the film. I know that sounds confusing. Now, when I announced that I was doing a film called Star Wars, the first question I normally get is, which one? And that is where the problem lies. Because, as I said in the intro, this film was originally just called Star Wars. The episode for A New Hope didn't actually come out until 1981. And in fact, that was the third version of this film. And I'll come on to that a bit later as well. But yeah, this film is called Star Wars. When I was a kid growing up and you what, read the TV mags, because you didn't have electronic program guides like we do today, it was always put in the magazines as Star Wars. Empire Strikes Back was always down as Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi was always Return of the Jedi, but this film was always called Star Wars. It wasn't until about the 1997 remasters that this started being really called and really hammered home that this was called A New Hope. But for people who are my age, this film will always be just Star Wars. Number nine, leave the film alone. So yes, this film was released in 1977 and it was praised for everything. Everything was a masterpiece. So what do they do? Well, they adjust it. I mean, the first adjustment came out in 1980. Now that adjustment was just minor color fixes, a bit of audio dubbing and little things like that. But then again, they made another version of this film in 1981. And this one had a major thing change where they added on, as previously said, episode four, A New Hope. And then there was a few more changes going through the 80s and 90s. And then in 1997, we had that big special edition version. And you would think that would be it. No, they have still carried on and played with this film, changing the special effects. I mean, go and watch the vision, version on Disney Plus to the version that came out in 1997. You see, especially Jabba the Hutt is different. Leave this film alone. It was brilliant when it came out in 1977. It doesn't really need to be changed so often. I mean, there is about 11 different theatrical versions of this film not to mention about 40 different versions of TV versions and regional versions. Leave this film alone. It was good enough to be on its own when it came out. Stop playing with it, because eventually you're going to play with it too much that you're going to ruin this film. Number eight, family. Has anyone actually heard of the Harry Potter is a ripoff of Star Wars motif? Well, it's quite true. So Harry Potter, his parents die, and he goes to live with his abusive aunt and uncle. Now, granted, in Star Wars, his aunt and uncle weren't abusive, and they raised him as their own. Except they didn't. If they were going to raise him as their own, he would, they would treat him like their son, not nephew. They were getting to grow up calling them mum and dad. But they didn't. Why not? I mean, even in this film, it is implied that he is something important and he is there to hide. You get that impression watching this film. Now, that was confirmed in episode three, uh, Revenge of the Sith, but obviously that film hadn't come out yet. So 
why didn't they treat him like their own son? No wonder he wanted to run away. I mean, let's face it, it's a good thing they didn't, otherwise he would have run away and joined the Rebel Alliance. But still, it worked out okay with Leia though. Number seven, how did Luke get unconscious? So when R2-D2 does a runner, Luke Skywalker and C-3PO go after him. They find him and then realize there's sand people tracking them. They go up into a ridge, look at these sand people, confirm it is sand people, then all of a sudden one appears behind him and actually starts attacking Luke Skywalker. He's using that big stick, whacking it on the ground and Luke is rolling side to side and the next thing, Luke's unconscious. Luke didn't get hit. How did Luke Skywalker get unconscious? What happened? I mean, I know they changed things, but that was never one of the edits that came out of this film. Or if it is, I can't find any research on that. But yeah, it asks a question. How did Luke Skywalker get knocked unconscious? Number six, Han shot first. Seriously, I could not do this video without bringing this up and also putting my little thoughts on this as well. I should bring back a Berryman's thoughts videos about this, but it's here. I might actually just cut this out and release it as a thoughts video as well. But still, we've already mentioned about all the different versions and all these different versions have different ways of who shot first, Han or Credo. I mean, one of them's a dodgy, Han Solo manages to move his neck sort of like this, but it doesn't make sense. Now, in the original version, the very original version, yes, Han shot first. Now, from a storytelling perspective, I prefer that version. Now, there are other versions where the timing was slightly delayed, where he managed to move or he was about to get fired on and stuff like that, but that makes him a little bit too good. I love the fact that Han Solo is introduced as a bad guy. He's not the bad guy of the film, but he's just a bad guy in general. And let's face it, women love a bad guy. Why does my missus love me then? But I love that. And especially coming up to the climax of the film, when Han Solo disappears, he's got the money. Now, because the Han shot first, you know he's a bad guy. You know he's not coming back. And then it's a more of a surprise when Han Solo does come back. Now, with this whole thing where you've edited so Credo shoots first and Han's just defending himself, you lose that bad boy image. So you actually lose the fact that Han returning is more of a surprise because you know he's a good guy. You know full well he's gonna come back. No, leave it as the Han shot first because it makes the ending of this film so much more better. Number five, lightsaber. Now, I know it was the 70s and the special effects weren't as good, but Luke's lightsaber, in some of the shots, it looks white, not that pale blue like he does in future films, or Ben Kenobi's one does. It's, that, it's a white color, and it never really stuck well with me. I remember that watching it, because strangely enough, I never watched Star Wars first. I actually watched Return of the Jedi first, and then watched Empire Strikes Back, and then watched Star Wars. So I watched it in the complete wrong order when I was a kid. So when I finally got around to watching Star Wars, I was confused why Luke Skywalker's lightsaber was white. I didn't fully understand that. Number four, wrong plans. Now, I know I sort of brought this up in the Rogue One video, and I did say I was going to bring that, it up properly in this video. But yes, the Death Star plans are completely wrong. The eye of the Death Star is in the center, yet on the Death Star, it's more like a quarter of the way down. Now, before anyone shoots me and says, but that's probably because they made that CGI computer graphic before they made the model, no because in the CGI plan, there is still the line around the Death Star. Now that line was a mistake on the model's part. It was never supposed to be there. The whole model was supposed to be a complete sphere. What happened was is when they made the Death Star model and they made the bottom half, they made the top half. And when they put it together, the center bit actually went in. It was a mistake. It was never supposed to have that trench around the middle but people thought it looked better and it was left in. So, how can you say that? The plans on the Death Star are completely wrong. They don't actually tally up with the film. Number three, timer on the Death Star. 
So as the Death Star is about to attack the moon of Yavin 4, it starts off saying firing range in 30 minutes and there's a timer in th of 30 minutes. Now at the end of the timer, it finally reaches zero. So the beginning and the end of that timer is fine, but the rest of it, it doesn't flow together. It doesn't really go down properly. It goes lower than high, it's all over the place. Or do they use a completely weird timing schedule where it's like five, seven, four, one, nine. Is, is that how they count in the Star Wars universe? It's a possibility, and I'm not gonna deny it, it's a possibility. But from an English person's point of view, it's wrong. There, I've said it. Number two, Fader actually won. So as we approach the climactic ending of this film, they're in a Death Star trench. Luke Skywalker is being chased by Darth Vader and two other TIE fighters. Vader goes, I have you now. He starts firing. What happened to them shots? Because there was quite a few shots. He was targeted, he was spot on his sight. He wouldn't have missed. So what actually happened? Because if those shots weren't there, and it's like, I have you now, and then the TIE fighter got blown up by Han Solo, I would believe it. But Vader, who even in this film was shown how good of a pilot he was, which is quite interesting when you learn that Anakin Skywalker was a brilliant pilot as well. The clues that he was his father were in this film, that's a different story. But yeah, Darth Vader fired. Darth Vader actually won, but those shots didn't go anywhere. Think about it. Number one, middles. Now, this has been done to death, that Luke Skywalker and Han Solo got medals and yet Chewbacca didn't. I agree with that and it is so wrong. I know they sort of sorted that out in the uh, Star Wars sequels, but it's still wrong. But it's actually worse than those theories because when you actually look back at it, there was actually five survivors of the attack on the Death Star. You had Han Solo, Luke Skywalker, who got the medals. You had Chewbacca, okay. You had Wedge and Tilly's. He never got a medal. There was also an unknown pilot in a Y-Wing. Why did he get a medal? Wedge and Tilly's definitely should have got a medal because let's face it, he saved Luke Skywalker. If it wasn't for Wedge and Tilly's, the Death Star would not have been destroyed. And he didn't get a medal. And what makes it worse is Wedge and Tilly's is the only person that was actually on the attacks of both Death Stars. He's the only person, because let's face it, Luke Skywalker didn't attack the Death Star, Han Solo didn't, the Millennium Falcon did, but it had a different crew. Why didn't Wedge and Tilly's get a medal? Why didn't the unknown pilot of the Y-Wing video? Why did only Chewbacca get all the attention from these missing medals? I want this film to be refilmed and have all five people get that medal. I don't care that if they don't name the Y-Wing pilot, but he deserves a medal. Bonus error, head bonking. I'm not putting this as part of the actual 10 things, but I can't actually do this video without mentioning that infamous head bonk. And one thing I did enjoy is the fact when the 1997 special editions came out, they didn't do anything to try and edit it out. In fact, they added sound effects to enhance it. It's probably one of the most known film errors of all time, and this film's embraced it. I love it. It's not included in the 10, but it does deserve a mention. Final thoughts. There's not really much to say about this film that hasn't already been said. I mean, the only things that add to this film now is fan theories. But when I look at just this film on its own, it is a masterclass. This is how a film is done right. You have great story, you have great acting, you have great special effects, which created industrial lighting magic who are nowadays the best special effects people in Hollywood. So they're so good, they actually work with their competition on Star Trek. That's how good the special effects are. Most of it's model shots, and I love that. Watch behind the scenes of how they film this, it makes this film even more impressive. There's nothing really wrong with this film. And the fact that apparently when this film was made, there was no overall story arc. It, they didn't know where it was gonna go. There was apparently no plans to, for Darth Vader to be Luke Skywalker's father. I don't believe that, but apparently that was true. And 
the fact that it still ties in, it still works, and it holds up today is impressive. The music is a little bit different compared to all the other ones, but it still worked. I love this film. There is not much wrong with this film. I mean, let's face it, I am being ultra nitpicky on this film. Just to prove a point that there's no thing that's a perfect film, this is close to it, and I'm not gonna deny it, but yes, it has those itty -witty, tiny little things wrong. And I am glad it has stood the test of time. We would not have this whole Star Wars franchise that's still going on to this day, which shows how impressive this film is. So what am I going to rank it? I have no choice because if I rank, if I put anything else, I think people will hunt me down and actually bash my door down and try and kill me. So I have no choice to give this a 10 out of 10 berries. If you disagree with me and say it is a nine or an eight or less, or say this is worse, unless you're John Joe, leave a comment. John Joe does not like this film. We have had plenty of conversations about this on Facebook. That's a different story. Anyway, enough of this week's video. Let's move on to next week's. Now, I've already announced what next week's video is gonna be. I announced it about uh, 10 weeks ago. It's the my 100th episode. So I am gonna do my favorite film of all time, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. See, I'm not even giving clues. That is gonna be the hardest video for me because that, to me, is a perfect film. However, I can still find flaws in that film. Wanna know what I found out about that? Well, come back next week. But until then, take care, bye-bye.